Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, in today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to tell you about non-invasive brain stimulation methods. Basically, we can draw a, a major distinction between stimulating the brain versus recording from the brain. So recording from the brain are standard imaging methods such as fMRI or EEG. In these methods, we give people tasks or show them stimuli and we measure what's going on in their brain. These are often called correlational methods because we're correlating brain activity with, for instance, stimuli or tasks. By contrast, stimulation methods are seen as being causation methods that we stimulate or cause changes in the brain and we then measure uh, changes in behaviour or cognition. So the inference is kind of the opposite. In one case, we're stimulating the brain and measuring behaviour and in imaging methods, we're manipulating behaviour and measuring the brain. These particular methods sit within a whole range or suite of methods, including both invasive and non-invasive measures. We can think of these measures as existing on a number of dimensions. One would be the temporal resolution, so how quickly um, these effects last in the brain, whether the effects of stimulation take days or weeks. For instance, if we give somebody an oral drug, it might take several hours, days or even weeks for this to show its effect. Uh, whereas other methods might be almost instantaneous. So a magnetic stimulation of the brain can happen on the millisecond scale, for instance. And in contrast, we then have a spatial resolution scale. So whether or not the whole brain is being affected or whether individual synapses or neurons are being affected and all different scales in between. If we look at this particular diagram here, this shows a, a variety of methods that fall under um, brain stimulation methods or brain manipulation methods, if we uh, phrase it another way. Within this in grey, we can see traditional invasive methods. So for instance, brain lesion studies or neuropsychological approaches. Here we're looking at effects of damaging parts of the brain and seeing what effects they have on cognition. Brain lesions uh, tend to be permanent, so here the temporal resolution is extremely poor. We effectively have no experimental manipulation over them, or very little. Uh, other methods that are used only in animals would include optogenetics, in which the animal has um, certain neurons which have um, uh, a, a special light-sensitive receptor uh, inserted into them genetically. And when you shine light on the, uh, the animal's brain, it will cause those neurons to fire. And we can see what effect that has um, on the behavior by triggering or activating those particular neurons. In the middle, we've got in green, what are called non-invasive brain stimulation methods. Uh, aside from ultrasound stimulation, there's a broad division between magnetic stimulation of the brain, which is basically TMS, and electrical stimulation of the brain, which includes direct current uh, and alternating current and what's called random noise stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, is one of the most commonly used um, stimulation methods in cognitive neuroscience. The equipment consists of a stimulating coil, typically in a figure of eight, Within that coil is wire wrapped round and round very densely, and through it is passed a current, a very brief uh, but strong current, and this generates a temporary magnetic field. This magnetic field will then travel across the, uh, the skull and start stimulating neurons uh, underneath the skull, so within the cortex itself, not particularly deeply within the brain, uh, so a small region, a centimetre squared or so, beneath the stimulating site. Here it's using the principle of electromagnetic transduction. So you've got an electric current in the stimulating coil, generating a magnetic field, and the magnetic field triggering a secondary current, in this case in the brain. Now what's happening when the brain is stimulated electrically is that it's firing in response to uh, the stimulation. 
This means that it can't do its normal job of firing in response to ongoing cognitional behavior. So the um, underlying neurons are effectively disrupted in their normal function by having this external stimulation applied. For this reason, TMS and similar methods is called a virtual lesion approach. Um, it's like a normal lesion in that it's disrupting the function of the brain, but it's virtual in the sense that it's not a permanent lesion, it's only temporary, and in fact, it's not really a lesion, it's just a very temporary disruption of uh, neural activity. The TMS pulse itself is very brief, so about one millisecond. So this means that TMS potentially has a very high temporal resolution. So for instance, we might be able to show um, the participant a stream of images, and we will be able to figure out at what time point that part of the brain is involved by stimulating at different intervals. The problem with this is that a single millisecond pulse is not particularly strong, so it may not have any effect on cognition at all. So instead, what people can do is have a train of pulses, maybe three or four pulses consecutively. So here we're reducing the temporal resolution, but we're increasing our chances of detecting that this region is actually important. And what we might see is, for instance, a slight slowing down in response time or other kinds of uh, minor errorful uh, behaviour. Uh, people, when they've had TMS, don't behave like brain damaged patients. The effects are quite subtle. There are a few exceptions to this where we might see overt changes. So, for instance, if we stimulate over our occipital cortex at the back of the brain that's involved in visual processing, and we do so in a dark room, people might report seeing tiny pinprick flashes of light. These are called phosphenes, and this is consistent, obviously, with the idea that this part of the brain is important for vision. If we stimulate over our motor cortex, which exists in two strips on the brain here, uh, and in the right place, we might find, for instance, that the, the finger starts to twitch. And this is a useful procedure. We use this to determine how much TMS stimulation to give. So we typically give it um, up to a certain level of motor threshold, the point at which you might start to see your finger twitching. How does TMS um, inform cognitive processes? Well, again, we can use TMS in order to see which parts of the brain are critical, because we might see a disruption of performance in, say, reaction time or errors. We can also figure out when a part of a brain is critical. So we might find that TMS over, say, the visual cortex means that people don't see things when it's applied 100 milliseconds after uh, the eyes have seen it, but actually it has no effect at, say, 300 milliseconds. So this tells us that this part of the visual cortex is important, but only important at particular time windows. We can also address other kinds of questions. So, for instance, one interesting research question is, well, what does the visual cortex of a blind person do? Well, we know from imaging methods such as uh, fMRI that if we put blind people in a scanner and get them, for instance, to read Braille or touch certain things, that the visual cortex will be active. So this suggests that the visual cortex might be important in this case in discriminating letters by touch. But because imaging is a correlational method, we can't be sure that this activity is actually causing the blind person to be able to discriminate. So, for instance, maybe the blind person is trying to use the visual cortex to aid in this process. But actually, the visual cortex isn't really doing anything. It's just a correlational uh, with uh, whatever it is that, that's actually being helpful uh, to this process. So TMS uh, can get around what is this part of the brain doing? Is it causally involved in this particular behaviour? So if we apply TMS uh, around the visual cortex when blind people are trying to recognise braille or embossed le letters, then we find that it does indeed disrupt their ability to recognise those letters. This suggests that it is actually important. It's not just correlational. It's actually functionally engaged in recognising letters, in this case via the fingers, instead of via the eyes. Contemporary electrical stimulation uses um, weak electrical currents passed through the brain. These are not harmful and they're far weaker than the kind of electrical currents that have been used in ECT or electroconvulsive therapy used in severe cases of depression. To do TS, you need two stimulating electrodes, one that's called an anode, which uh, carries a positive charge, and one that's called a cathode, 
which is a negative in polarity. If you have direct current, then there's a constant flow of uh, electrical charge between the uh, positive and the negative um, electrodes. If you use alternating current, then the two stimulating charge uh, sites continually change between cathode, anode, cathode, anode. So the current is going backwards and forwards uh, between the two uh, sites rather than being constant in direction. Transcranial random noise stimulation also changes between the, the two sites, but does so in an unpredictable rather than rhythmic way. These different ways of stimulating the brain mean that we can uh, manipulate uh, the brain in various ways. It gives us a little bit more flexibility than, say, TMS. If we think about direct current stimulation, in which the uh, stimulating electrodes are either constantly uh, an uh, a cathode or constantly an anode, um, here what you can do is that one of these uh, sites will become the, uh, the stimulating site of interest and the other one will be a control site. So the stimulating site of interest you obviously put on the region of the brain that's central to your hypothesis and the other one is put on a region of the brain that's of no interest or maybe not on the brain, for instance, on your shoulders. Here what's interesting is that the, where the, um, the nature of the stimulation uh, can either improve cognition or make it worse. So uh, if you place a cathode on uh, a region of the brain, then this acts rather like a virtual lesion approach. It tends to disrupt cognitive uh, performance, makes your reaction times longer or makes you more error prone. Whereas if you um, use uh, anodal stimulation, it has the opposite effect. It can paradoxically improve performance. Um, here, what it's doing is that it's either enhancing uh, neural activity, it's increasing the excitability or reducing the excitability um, of your neurons. And it might do this by modulating particular neurotransmitter systems, such as the GABA system, which is inhibitory, versus glutamate, which is an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. They might also have longer term effects on the brain, which aren't affecting um, electrical activity as such, but is affecting synaptic action um, over a longer time scale. So for instance, if we put the stimulating pad over the um, occipital lobes and we use cathodal stimulation, so this is inhibiting or um, producing a virtual lesion, what we find is that people are worse at detecting visual stimuli. And we can see also that if we record EEG from this site, that the visually evoked potentials are lower. We have less electrical activity coming from the visual cortex. Whereas anodal stimulation has the opposite effect. It increases your ability to detect visual stimuli, and it also means that your visually evoked potentials are larger. So anodal stimulation can be used in rehabilitation. So for instance, after stroke, you might want to make your motor cortex uh, more excitable so you can uh, generate more motor behavior. Transcranial alternating current stimulation doesn't have a fixed anode or cathode. The electrical current is continually changing direction between the two stimulating pads. So here it's not operating in the same way. What is happening here instead is that you can actually train the brain to oscillate in a particular rhythm, or training the neurons in the brain to fire at particular rhythmic rates, such as in the alpha band or the beta band and so on. So in a way, this is similar to the EEG rhythms that we see in natural cognition. Whereas in EEG, we're just uh, recording these natural rhythms. In uh, tax transcranial alternating current stimulation, we're generating these rhythms. We're encouraging the, the brain and these neurons to fire in particular rhythmic patterns. And again, we can see what Im impact that has on, for instance, your ability to detect visual stimuli or uh, attention or motor behavior.